one of the most asked questions I get in my comments, emails, and DMs is, what's your favorite transit system? Or what is the perfect transit system? And while trying to avoid stoking complete flame wars in the comments, I decided it's a question that's worth answering. Of course, this is opinion. But talking about what might make a system perfect is a good way of talking about the shortcomings and successes of various systems, and perhaps even elements that are good that people have never noticed before. And instead of starting with just simply stating what I think the perfect system is, or at least one of the ones that gets the closest, we'll start by getting into the weeds a little bit and talking about how you would plan the perfect transit system. So let's dive in. At the core of any good transit network is accessibility, and while you might appreciate that elevators are a good feature to have in a station, you might think that they're not the most important thing. But that's a very limited view of accessibility. In my personal view, accessibility measures are really anything that brings down the barriers to using a transit service. Be it level boarding, tactile paving, audio and visual wayfinding, escalators, public washrooms, and yes, indeed, elevators. And in the future, we might start seeing things like good air quality and air conditioning as features that are important for accessibility as well. Ultimately, I think most people don't really notice a lot of accessibility measures because most systems have made the most basic affordances. But I'm pretty sure if most people were to go into a system that didn't have escalators, didn't have good level boarding, and didn't have very much wayfinding, they'd notice pretty quickly. A poorly accessible system can be almost impossible to use at worst and a total pain to use at best. Now having transit infrastructure like rapid transit stations that need elevators is great, but if the trains don't come often, it's not worth a lot. Frequent trains and buses and comprehensive service to all corners of a city is important for meaning that people can easily go where they want to go when they want to go on public transit. And when transit's good, more service is introduced and it becomes more convenient. It's a virtuous cycle. But simply being able to go somewhere and making it easy are different things. If the best way of getting across a city or from the city center to an airport is a slow local bus, well, that's not very good transit. And you probably chose the wrong mode for that type of trip. For region scale trips, you almost always want rail service because the reality is in most places, the speed limits for rail are much higher than for road vehicles of any type. On the other hand, when you're doing a neighborhood scale trip, a bike can be a pretty good option or a bus or a tram when you need the extra capacity. And even if you do have rail which spans your city, if the mode is wrong, well, it's not doing its job as well as it could be. No one wants to ride a metro line for two hours, stopping at every single station along the way. I'm looking at you, Shanghai. And speaking of bikes, if your city isn't friendly to cyclists and especially pedestrians, it's hard to be all that good at transit because every transit trip starts with a person either walking or rolling. Unless that is you have a bus that stops just outside of your bedroom. Now, all of the different modes are critical, but they also need to be integrated. Passengers shouldn't have to consult different maps to ride two different types of trains through the same area. And connecting from one line to another, even if they're part of separate systems, should still be really easy and convenient, whether that be from metro to tram or tram to bus. At the same time, fares should be logical, integrated, and not punitive. People shouldn't be stuck riding a bus next to a much faster train line just because they don't want to pay extra for a premium rail fare. Reduced cost or free fares should be provided for people who are on social assistance, students, young people, and all kinds of other groups. Navigating the system should also be simple. Stations and stops should be designed so they stand out, so you can easily see them from a distance, and navigating them should be intuitive. When signage does exist, it should be clear and easily visible. And when you have complex service patterns or confusing networks, you should consider digital signage that can use motion and graphics to explain the system to people. This is something that's possible now with the emergence of low cost and highly reliable LCD screens. And just because you wanna go somewhere at night doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to take transit. Night service is critical. And when you have a night service, it should be oriented towards the trips that riders are taking at night while keeping the door open to other types of trips that planners might not be expecting. Development around your transit routes and infrastructure should also be tuned to that transit. Bus routes make sense in low density areas, but rail routes should be surrounded by high density not only because of its high capacity, but because it also creates a virtuous cycle. When you have high density around rail, you feed the rail passengers and rail with lots of passengers runs more frequently and provides more capacity for more development. But none of that is worth much if your transit isn't humming along or if it's left dank and dirty. Most famous transit systems around the world have gone through periods of decline and they have never been good for those cities. 
maintaining a state of good repair so the transit can operate well, and even just keeping infrastructure and vehicles clean is critical to keeping transit a good experience. And even when your system works today, it should never stop getting better. Despite the whole point of this video being the perfect transit system, that's always going to be an aspiration because no transit system is perfect. They could always help being more accessible or having a few more trains per hour late at night. And as cities grow and change, which all great ones do, transit networks also have to grow and change to remain the best way to get around, or at least competitive. Now, a short interjection. If you're not following me over on Instagram or Substack, you should. On Instagram, I post all kinds of photos of my various travels, whereas on Substack, I talk about things that would be too nerdy for this YouTube channel. They're extremely nerdy. Now, you probably came to this video to hear about a perfect or near-perfect transit system, and while well, like children, I can't just choose one, I'll give you one that's close. And in that case, I think Paris sets a very high bar. Obviously, its transit network offers excellent service and great coverage, but it also has all the modes. High-speed rail, commuter rail, suburban rail, urban rail, rail on streets, rail on hills, buses, buses on rail, buses on busways, and soon, gondolas. And, unlike in some cities, in actually reasonable locations. What I've always found interesting about Paris is that unlike New York, which is a subway city, or Sydney, which is a suburban rail city, Paris really isn't an anything city. It has a great suburban rail network, a great urban rail network, and an awesome tram network that keeps expanding year over year. And even within each transit mode, these services and vehicles are well adapted. On the tram network, there are tram routes, and then there are express tram routes, and the various bus services are provided using different types of buses. Buses that don't make a lot of stops and travel long distances tend to use more comfortable vehicles. It's all just very well considered. And in the last few years under Mayor Anne Hidalgo, getting around by foot or by bike has become even more of a joy, as space has been taken away from cars and given to people. The design of the system is also unsurprisingly great. From the beautiful streetscapes created around the latest tram routes, to the incredible architecture of the stations, to the wayfinding, almost everything is very well thought out. These systems also just keep getting better every year, as I mentioned they should. For the RER, the new digital wayfinding, which shows you the particular branch your train is going to go down, is some of the best I've ever seen. And the LCD screens on the newest MP14 Metro trains actually show you which car you're in when you arrive at a station and where your exits are, which is awesome, and is something I'd only previously seen in Asia. And the network is also just growing, with the Grand Paris Express, RER expansion, and new tram lines. Paris just isn't standing still, which means the version of it that people see during the 2024 Olympic Games will be different from the version of it they would have seen 10 years before. And 10 years down the road, Paris will also be completely different. Now, as I said, perfect is an aspiration, and Paris's system is not perfect. The accessibility of the legacy metro network in particular is very poor and the level of cleanliness can often make you feel like you're stepping into a metro station that is as old, well, as it is. The night service, while comprehensive, is behind London and many German cities where trains also run overnight, at least on weekends, allowing people to explore all that the city has to offer, which is something you really want to do in Paris. But that's the reality of real transit systems. They aren't ever perfect. But Paris is almost as close as you can get, and that's worth a lot.